Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my show Rocket Monday. In today's episode, we're gonna take a look at orbits. So let's go around it. So all you have to understand about it, it's Newtonian physics. Basically, it's not quantum physics. It's very easy to understand. It's very calculatable. There is no uh, magic quantum tunneling here. It's very simple. It's what we call classical physics, sometimes also referred to as Newtonian physics. Now, many of you must have heard the story that, you know, uh, Apple fallen, you know, Newton's head. But I also heard, a, you know, conflicting report about the story. So I do not know which one is true. But a uh, story that I have heard goes around like, uh, apple fell while he was looking at the moon so problem was that when apple fall he thought that why the heck moon is not falling like earth is here why the heck moon is not falling and yes it did happen in day you can see moon uh, many times in daylight also but uh, it's not very bright so many times we uh, you know flat out ignore it so do look around you will find moon during daytime so that triggered his imagination is like why the heck you know big thing that's supposed to be falling is not falling versus apple that is small thing is falling so you know things happen so he devised a very clever experiment what we call newtonian cannon basically if you have a earth and you fire something from a cannon big powerful cannon it will go around but it will fall over time it will fall so let's say you didn't fire it fast enough it will fall point a you fire it a bit faster if it will fall point b you fire it a bit faster now at some point you will fire it so fast that before it falls the curvature of earth you know uh, bends below it so if it's going 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 trying to fall trying to fall the rate of its falling is basically uh, you know slower than the slower would be wrong word but basically the curvature of earth is preventing it from falling basically it cannot fall because earth you know earth itself is bending away so that's what we call orbit now of course there are hundreds of, of, of things interacting here like every celestial body including sun uh, you know moon and uh, solar wind and atmospheric drag and everything but this is the rough idea if you fire something fast enough it will fall it is continuously falling but problem is it cannot fall fast enough that it will reach earth so basically earth is like nope 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 and that's why many time you will hear people saying this word uh, space station is free falling Basically, you are not a place where you have zero gravity. Uh, International Space Station has 88% of Earth's gravity. But because it's in free fall, it's continuously falling. It it's always feels as zero G. Basically, there is no gravity. The effects of gravity is gone. So be mindful of that. And it's uh, generally uh, when we talk about orbits, we are generally generally talking about large celestial bodies as in you know jupiter saturn uranus neptune mercury venus and all that thing and sun is also orbiting around milky way milky way is not orbiting anything so uh, that way there are always things small and big small as in like small asteroids versus uh, big things as in sun there are a lot of things that are orbiting it's a very common thing it's found throughout the universe throughout the night sky and your size really doesn't matter you can be a dust cloud and you can still be orbiting something so be mindful of it it does not matter about the size so that's what orbit is so what are the uses of it well there are millions of orbit types so let's try not to go into them but uh, you have to understand each orbit provides a unique tool that you can use orbit itself is a tool this is a very good graph that you can uh, find and uh, i will try to link below or try pasting a high quality here if this one is not reading clearly basically the higher you go the rotational period of your orbit will become slower so basically if you are orbiting very close to earth you are orbiting at roughly 20 minutes to 40 minutes your one orbit is taking 20 to 40 minutes you go above it takes 10 you go above at certain point you reach 24 hours that's why you go you see this is going up so once you reach that perfect height where the orbital period is 24 hours you reach a what we call geostationary orbit basically uh, if you look down from that satellite you will see one thing same thing on earth continuously like that's it so what do we use that for communication like all your tv direct to home basically dish if you see them pointing somewhere that's what it's pointing to that is your stationary satellite uh, when i say communication i don't mean your phone call that goes through it or your internet basically tv uh, weather satellites and things of that nature because the bandwidth is not that high it's very good for broadcasting however so television satellites and, and uh, slow speed internet is very uh, you know primary use mainly is used for tv satellites 
but uh, you might be like okay what doesn't that make perfect spy satellite actually no because there is something known as inverse square law basically the further you are uh, the less uh, light you get that means if you are in geostationary which is upwards of 30000 km up you need a telescope to see on what's going on earth however if you are at low uh, earth orbit basically below 500 you need a very small telephoto lens you basically need a normal type satellite now you might be like okay but uh, you know doesn't it have non continuous coverage basically the coverage will break yeah but you can launch multiple of it and it's cheaper to launch at that orbit that's why spy satellites are generally at lower earth orbit which you have to be mindful does not mean there is no spy satellites at higher altitude it's just that uh, if you want to do optical surveillance is generally preferred to be at uh, low earth orbit because the hubble telescope the whole design of hubble telescope is upgraded from a spy satellite which was at very high altitude so you need basically like hubble space telescope to compensate for you know that distance not the atmosphere the fact that you are 30000 km away like uh, the radial size the size of earth becomes so small you need freaking giant telescope to like you know uh, actually do any real work so there are heights of orbit each height will provide a very uh, you know clear advantage and very clear side effect like for instance uh, in geostationary your uh, batteries need to be very small so let's say you are doing tv broadcasting you are receiving from ground station and you are broadcasting all around the world also and you need solar power for that also but here's the deal you go through earth's shadow uh, for a very short amount of time because the orbit is so long even though your receiving station like basically the place you are broadcasting to has gone uh, you know during the night side you are still in the sunlight and sunlight 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 so sometimes you can be as low as 1 to 5 hours of dark side you have to balance in whole day so your battery size has to be very small now in compared to that for uh, low you know basically uh, lower earth orbit your battery has to be working at 50% of the time so it's not like uh, Five hours in twenty-four hour day. It's basically two uh, hours per day. You have to run on battery. So be mindful of. It. There are pros and cons to all of this, and there are many types of orbit. Now the reason why everybody keeps saying about Leo, 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 lower Earth orbit, lower Earth orbit, because that's the starting point. Be mindful of that. That's not the most useful, but that is the starting point of orbit. You, you can orbit lower than that, but because of atmospheric drag, you might as well need a nuclear engine to you know keep you uh, up aloft. and they have tried that the soviet union did try that so <laughs> i am not making this up they actually tried that so for practical reason we want to be as low as possible for ease of you know actually approaching that's why iss is so low and another fact of that is what we call van allen belt this is a belt where uh, radiation basically high energy particle is trapped because of earth's magnetic field if a human goes there they're dead if a electronics go there they have to have compensation for it from grounding circuits to make sure they have fault tolerant to make sure they have uh, redundancy against bit flip there is a whole plethora of things that has to be done to make sure their electronics works and humans simply cannot live there for long enough so iss is generally put so low that it's uh, below van allen radiation belt that's why iss is so low and keeping it low uh, means the rocket does not have to spend so much energy to travel that far so for this reason iss is very low like on this image iss is like barely off the surface to give you a visual context one is 500 km and geostationary is 30000 km and then there are other extreme types of orbit which we call lagrange point orbit basically this is what we call l1 l2 l3 l4 and l5 now this is a only happens when you have two body one massive body one smaller body it will happen you know earth moon it will happen generally very prominent one is uh, earth and sun now basically that means if you put something in l3 it will stay there now be mindful stability of these points are not equal so if you put something at l4 it's not going to go away even if you fire thrusters like of course if you have big enough thrusters it can be fired away but uh, it won't go anywhere because it's a stabilizing like it's a, if you put something there even if it uh, you know nudges off it will come back now same happens in l3 but it's forward and backwards direction so but if it goes left or right or you know uh, in this direction yeah it's done it will lo lose that orbit so all the points are not stable that's why uh, when you hear people say the james webb telescope does not have life that's what they are referring to because it will be at l2 it has to have a uh, propulsion engine basically rocket engines uh, you know keeping it doing the station keeping because it's gonna you know move away over time now if uh, let's say uh, james webb were put at l5 it would have lasted there for very long time why they didn't do that distance is ludicrously far apart so 
and that's the whole point so be mindful we also use these lagrange points for our satellites uh, so if you have solar observatory basically you want to observe the sun best point is l1 there uh, there are some satellites there and if you want to observe for the universe we want to send things to l2 which will be james webb space telescope so these are orbits and their use so let's understand satellite itself now leo as i already mentioned that's why all the rockets are mentioned as leo capacity like uh, that's why you hear falcon 9 can send 20 ton now that 20 ton is to leo you can't send 20 ton to geostationary it simply does not have enough thrust to send that much to geostationary that high so from practical point, uh, standpoint of view, uh, all the rockets are always measured in LEO. Benefit of that is, is, is that you can easily compare. Side effect of that, sometimes uh, you may get misleading result. So you may be thinking like, okay, Falcon 9, you know, has 20 ton capacity. My satellite, geostation satellite is 10 ton. Uh, I can send it. You have to double check. They might have to boost the, you know, uh, rocket engine or they might have to let go of, uh, you know, reusing the boosters to, you know, get that extra velocity. So it's helpful in one way uh, bad in another way now geostationary as you can see in this image uh, each country gets its own uh, basically band of space that you can see whenever you see that uh, debris and satellite images this slim ring that you see around the equator that is the geostationary band so basically each country gets a uh, basically cone of that band is dedicated to one country you can't point like uh, china cannot place a satellite that is you know interfering in earth uh, india's uh, geostationary orbit nor usa can place something that interferes in there not even spy satellite because this uh, region is very closely monitored by every country and if somebody triggered a disaster there let's just say it's gonna kill everything because most of the satellites are below it including gps satellites so if if any uh, catastrophe were to occur in this orbit basically geostationary everything below is in danger so for this reason you can easily see every country gets their own uh, basically inclination as you will so usa has 98 point that and uh, japan has 140 degree east uh, india has 94 degree east so for this reason you get a specific specific degree that's why each uh, country gets their own dth direct to home service now there are uh, two things you have to understand if you are rotating with the earth like earth is rotating like this clockwise and you are going with this clockwise it's what we call uh, prograde orbit now if you are going against it if you're like earth is rotating this way and you're like no i'm gonna go against it uh, that that's what we call retrograde we don't generally like to use retrograde that means a bigger rocket has to be used for sending smaller payload because you are fighting as earth's rotation if you are going with earth's rotation basically uh, that's like earth is swinging you along now if you are going retrograde you have to fight that like earth is throwing you away and you're like i have to go back so for this reason uh, most of the satellites are prograde generally only few for some reasons are retrograde and there is one weird thing about orbits that you have to understand there is what one thing what we call its graveyard orbit now this orbit is above this geostationary orbit now above this like uh, uh, 30 to 300 kilometer above from that from uh, orbital point there is what we call graveyard orbit now you might be like okay why the heck we send things there in graveyard orbit rather than you know uh, burying it underground like basically you know sending it down two core reasons first sending it down means you have to uh, create a very clear path you cannot interact with any other satellite because there are many satellites there there is a uh, like you know 20 plus GPS satellites, 30 plus uh, GLONASS satellites, uh, 15 plus uh, um, ROSCOM satellites. There are hundreds of satellite systems, weather satellite systems and uh, sun synchronous orbit satellite systems. So you have to create a path that is completely clean uh, of, of any other satellite. So suffice to say that's a kind of a hell of a headache. Now, on top of that, that itself is not that big of an issue. However, the engines you require to deorbit geostationary, it's very, uh, you know, energy intensive. The delta V, as they call it, the energy required to, you know, deorbit from geostationary is very high. That's why it takes a big rocket to send that geostationary. So to go from geostationary to basically graveyard orbit, it's a very small rocket thrust to 5 Yeah, 
now it's at graveyard but if you want to deorbit it you have to fire a big engine for a very long time for this reason uh, the fact that it requires very big and heavy delta uh, v we generally don't prefer the fact that you know we will try to slow it down and then make sure there is a you know corridor that's completely clean of every other satellite and not every satellite has uh, you know maneuverability a lot of satellite uh, do but not every satellite does have that and so far one satellite collisions have happened where uh, uh, one navigation satellite got hit by a old defunct satellite a uh, lot of debris so for this reason we generally prefer to you know just send things to graveyard orbit now can anything come back from graveyard orbit uh, unlikely but it is possible let's say if a meteoroid or uh, for some reason lot of solar wind occurred at very small uh, you know small period of time it can push things down and that would be a very bad day if that were to occur so these are the orbits that you have to understand now there are also extra earth uh, basically outside of earth there are uh, other orbits also which we use which we are generally used for what we call low energy travel basically if you don't want to use giant rocket to send a small payload to mars you gonna use what we call home in transfer method basically you gonna use the earth's uh, orbit around the sun not uh, you know its spin its uh, orbit around the sun to send your uh, payload along benefit very small rocket can send very large uh, payload relatively speaking to mars uh, that's how india got its uh, you know payload to uh, mom basically the mom uh, mars mangalyaan we call it in india but it's mom if you want to derive it in short terms it was sent using that consequence it's ludicrously slow that's why everybody keeps saying it takes 2 years to go and this uh, method also require what we call window you have to find alignment that is just perfect if you try to uh, you know uh, launch any time you want you can still go to mars it's not that do not think that you cannot go to mars like if you know if that window is not there you can go there you just have to use super large rocket to send super small payload so to optimize that generally we have a what we call window that's why you keep hearing window there is a window every two year so in in that window you have to spend least amount of fuel to get the most amount of payload but if you have very powerful engine let's say very powerful uh, you know nuclear powered ion engines you can do that thing uh, with, you wouldn't need this method however we don't have that technology yet now uh, there are other orbits also like this which we call comet orbits now they are generally done for advanced research and things of that nature generally research of comet itself uh, that's why some satellites follow this and uh, rosetta satellite and all that so these are uh, extra orbit that we generally call transfer orbits now let's talk about the most uh, talked about topic in the internet kessler syndrome now what you have to understand is basically if you increase the velocity the power you get on impact doubles so it's like you increase the speed by 10% you don't get impact energy by 10% you get 10 square that's the horrifying part and all these thing that you see these are traveling at minimum at 24000 km per hour basically 11 to 15 kilometers per second minimum otherwise they wouldn't be in orbit so at that minimum speed even a small grain can cause very severe damage that is caused by a very small pellet and that's 1 inch thick aluminum and it's just like boom it's very big damage so this is why everybody is so worried about it like you know what if a collision happen you don't need you know big things hitting you it's not like you know where you have a, a pebble in a road and you know it hits your uh, car going at like 300 km per hour it will barely damage your windshield like of course it could crack it but it's not going to uh, you know annihilate your car but you get hit something as big as like uh, let's say uh, object that is weighing upwards of uh, let's say 500 grams or half a kg yeah you done like that's like a nuke level uh, energy output so people are worried about it and rightly so because the energy is involved in these things this junk now what this junk is made of first defunct satellites satellites that were not at geostationary but they did not have the engines to you know uh, Uh, you know crash them onto earth over time they will crash but uh, they will crash so slowly like they have been there for let's say 20 years 30 years people are still waiting come on come down come down you know because if you are very close to low earth orbit you crash almost in uh, one year to 15 years but as you go up the crash time goes down and down down and down so at geostationary if your satellite goes burst at geostationary and you can't send it to graveyard orbit yeah that satellite will be there for very long time and you can't knock it out like we don't have the tech yet 
and it's not that we can't do it we have the physics ready we have the rocket engines ready it's just that uh, to remove a satellite that costed 500 million to launch you have to spend 800 million to actually go there fire a rocket engine and then you know slowly safely carefully move it but as our uh, you know orbits get uh, more filled up because there is a limited amount of space in what we call geostationary band so we have to do this if there is a satellite that you know that cannot be sent on its own to graveyard orbit so collision does happen this sort of thing does happen do not think like it never happens i already mentioned one old defunct satellite got destroyed by uh, not old uh, defunct satellite destroyed one functioning satellite it happened it's common thing to happen and uh, this is an image of uh, international space station from its uh, collision point of view all this red area is getting constantly bombarded now you might be like okay why the heck it's not getting destroyed one very simple reason now even though you get a lot of energy with uh, you know this side of small size of collision the iss is specifically built with armors now what is that uh, armor simply means is basically they figured out like if they can only send one centimeter thick aluminum as like you know due to their weight constraint it is better for them to split that aluminum into two parts one six millimeter one four millimeter so that way if something hits it because of ludicrously high energy it shatters now of course there's gonna be hole there now because it has shattered and directionality like from a pinpoint it has went like a, you know more like a shotgun blast the second aluminum sheet which is only four centimeter thick uh, for millimeter thick it can easily absorb it so there won't be a direct penetration and uh, this was done they tested it out okay everything got and now in this international space station the layer uh, the gap between those two aluminum sheet is filled with uh, high quality kevlar basically it's a bulletproof so due to this reason they are getting bombarded they are getting bombarded 24 into 7 uh, but they can survive simply because they have armor now on top of that they are only getting bombarded by small object that's why like high risk impact when they say like small object like you know a nail uh, what i'm saying about basically nut bolts that is falling off from upper satellites or uh, defunct old uh, you know ro uh, rocket stages but whenever there is something big as i told you like half a kg big yeah then they're gonna move this whole station the station has what we call pizza box basically that pizza box is always monitored like this whole orbit from above to bottom is always monitored so that nothing big like small things is getting hit by 24 into 7 but nothing big as in like there is a minimum size that it can handle but once you exceed that size let's say there is a whole second stage of a rocket coming to it yeah iss is not going to withstand that that it cannot withstand it can withstand small small things but it cannot withstand you know a whole second stage crashing into it it's going to be destroyed for that reason there is a lot of radar station ground station uh, stations on this itself uh, station that are above satellites uh, they provide a sort of coverage where if they spot something that is big let's say a second stage of a big rocket coming towards it they're gonna move the iss they're like nope we, we're not gonna take any risk it's just just move that and that gap is very large so that's why it's look like a pizza box the volume of it is looks uh, like a pizza box so they move it around and uh, it's tracked constantly so even if you see this many junk not all of the junk is that big so big one we always track and small one we, we have to bear it it's like din, 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 we have to bear it like we have to bear it now be mindful this uh, thing one people uh, one of my friend asked me and it was quite a good question if there are this many like millions and millions of tracked debris that means it's big enough to be tracked by radio how the heck we can even send any rocket without it blowing up the reason for that is the volume in space basically the space in space is very large so the volume of earth is no way near the compare of the volume that we have uh, you know in space because earth is only 6000 kilometer okay this gap is 30000 kilometers so as you can understand the volume wise it's very very mind bogglingly vast to give you a context of this think of it this way our oceans or sea have uh, like ludicrously large amount of uh, you know life into it like fish uh, sharks and all that but every time you, when you jump do you get attacked by a shark or do you get attacked by a fish like most of the time when you take a jump into a sea or a river or an ocean you don't interact with anything because there is a lot of empty space between these things same happens here and there are clusters of area where let's say uh, when china uh, attacked uh, one of its own satellite its uh, their cell satellite they wanted to test out their weapon it created a lot of debris now that debris is like a clumped uh, clumped area because it happened from a one source that whole area has been evacuated it's like okay there is this one clump going around the earth and every satellite is like 
moved away so there are clubs and rocket uh, launches have uh, happens where they take into consideration okay that lump is there let's not launch when our you know we have direct part to that okay lumps passes at let's say 7 am so let's launch at 8 8 a.m. to make sure like you know it's far off so there is a lot of space that's why it's not happening and big objects we track however if a runaway happens which hasn't happened yet thankfully we're gonna lose access to space the reason for that is like if big objects collides with another big objects it creates enough small objects the whole space gets littered by small objects small objects cannot be you know tracked properly and not to mention if it's small enough and uh, you know covers a large area not in patches like this whole area is covered no rocket can go through so that's what what we call Kessler syndrome that's why it's not happening away because the gap between uh, you know the large chunks is very large and small objects we can just withstand uh, but if two large objects let's say two geostationary satellite or one graveyard satellite you know for some reason gets deorbited or get hit by a meteoroid and you know bashes into uh, you know a working satellite big satellite then it's all over for humanity. Humanity is gonna lose entire space capability in fraction of a second. Because if runaway happens, uh, we can't track satellites. And not to mention satellites cannot move like, you know, as freely as in shown in uh, science fiction movies. They have like, you know, okay, I'm gonna change my degree a little bit, little bit. Even ISS, which has rocket engines, like as in it uses the engine that is uh, docked with uh, Soluse capsule. It does not have the like, you know, it's not Millennium Falcon. It still has a very limited range of movement. And because of the G-force limitation, it slowly does it. Now, if something big happens here, like let's say in these outside orbit, you're dead. You have to abort, you're dead. Now, atmosphere will still protect us. Nothing will, um, you know, get to us. But this is a very serious thing. So this was my presentation. I know it went a bit long. I hope you still liked it. And in that case, please leave a like. If you didn't, don't worry about it. You can dislike it. And I would urge you to uh, comment what you want to see in the next episode of Rocket Monday. Please share amongst your friends and subscribe to my channel. And if you are free, press the bell icon. And as always, thanks for watching.